The limitations are mental limitations. They're psychological and emotional limitations about what it is we're allowing ourselves to see about the nature of the universe. Moray and I had a very nice little chat about this, that it is a game in many ways of perception. And you get the world that you perceive. If you keep perceiving it on one level, indeed, you will get that world. And if you open that world up, which is the purpose of this entire conference, you will get a larger, infinite world. Okay, without further ado, I want to bring on Judy Wood and get down to some more brass tacks so we can progress our evolutionary thrust in today's afternoon. Judy Wood. Hello. Well, what makes a scientist? The lab coat? Many folks have, have said that, well, she's not a scientist, she's not an engineer. Well, what makes an engineer? My, I have degrees that show it. I have a lot of experience that shown that. But a lot of folks need an icon. They need somebody to look the position in order to take it seriously. So I'll go ahead and take these off, or maybe take me more seriously if I wore the, the coat. There you go. Most people don't realize that this lab coat originally came from, does anyone know? Madison Avenue. They decided that doctors will look more official and authoritative if they wore a white lab coat. Thanks. Well, one thing that does make a scientist is a bag of evidence. This is evidence, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So where did the towers go? We assume where they went. But did anyone ever stop to think about that question? One thing about evidence is that it's there, it's truth. The evidence is always the truth. Assumptions are where you go get off track. So let's start. Once upon a time, there were two buildings, two towers, and then they went away. Well, third tower and a fourth tower. This is all that was left. This is just that yellow corner of that building and all that was left. To remind you what was there beforehand, and here's just, just that little corner is all that was left. This is the dawn of a new age. There exists some technology that can make a building of that size go away. It has the ability to direct energy in such a way to disrupt the molecular bonds. It's also, uh, energy is direct as opposed to being kinetic energy. Kinetic energy like a wrecking ball or uh, a missile or something solid. We're going to go through the data and see that you can eliminate about every kind of uh, kinetic energy weapon. And we know this technology exists. The whole world saw it, even though they were told they saw something else. They saw what happened. And this indeed is a technology that can be used for free energy. It doesn't need to be used for evil purposes. Again, that's all that was left, just a story or two of that. End. And would you believe it that 14 people survived in there? So what we're, we're going to learn is that the towers didn't burn up, nor did they slam to the ground, but turned into dust in midair. That's not a collapse, that's dust squirting up. Why did so few people see that? Because they were told to see a collapse, maybe? There's three main things that keep people from seeing what's going on. Problem solving skills, group think, you know, peer pressure, and that they're terrified by the implications. We're going to just focus on the problem solving aspect. I tell you, the answer is 27. Am I right? Well, 
um, what's, what's the question? What's the problem I'm solving? If you don't know the problem, how do you, how do you know if the answer is right or wrong? You first have to define a problem before you can solve it. And it can be referred to as a syntax error because the order matters. Like when doing this math, are you adding those numbers together first or multiplying these first? You'll end up with a different answer depending on how you group them. The same thing with crime solving or with problem solving. The order matters. So if you start out with a theory, you know, we have thermite or we have bombs or we have airplanes or whatever theory someone has, and they, they take their pick from this list of things, and then they go cherry picking and searching for the data that's going to support their theory. So in, ess in essence, what they've done is determine the problem. But what happens if it was something else that they didn't take into consideration? They'll never get to the right answer. And that actually is one of the key things in a cover-up. You get people arguing about guesses, about uh, assumptions about what the problem is, and they never look at the problem. If you don't look at the problem, you can't solve it. So what they're using is a theory to determine what happened. That's, that's the wrong direction. We have to start out with what happened. You collect data, and the data always tells you what happened. And from that, you determine how it happened. But only after you, you first establish what happened can you determine how it happened. If you don't know what it is, you can't determine how it happened. For example, Look at these beams falling with dust trailing behind them, opaque dust. Let's say you're going to um, impersonate one of those beams. So you cover yourself with dust and jump off the top of the building. From the ground up, would someone see that dust trailing off of you? No. You need more dust. Okay, let's say you get a couple of armloads of flour and eject it out as you're falling. Can you impersonate this? You know? No, that's opaque dust. It, it originally, it initially blocked out all of the sunlight, 100% of the sunlight, so it was pitch black. It's very dense dust. And you come to the realization that these pieces of material are becoming dust. They're frothing up into dust as they fall. And they didn't hit the ground. But if you didn't know that uh, these turned to dust, and you start out with an assumption, you wouldn't get to the right answer because do you know of anything that could turn a building to dust in midair? Something turned it to dust in midair. So it's important to first determine what happened, then how it happened, and only then who did it or why they did it. But again, we're just going to focus on what happened. The towers didn't slam to the ground. If they had slammed to the ground, there would be over a million tons of debris left stacked up in the ground. That didn't happen. Manhattan would have been flooded. Well, as we'll see, the towers were built in the Hudson River with a dike around them. If you slam a million tons of debris down onto the dike, you're going to break it. Didn't happen. And if you slammed a million tons of debris to the ground, it's going to make a thud. The seismic signals did not reflect that. Those are the three biggest issues, but there's a whole lot of others as well, but we'll focus on those initially. The lack of debris, the fact the bathtub wasn't damaged, and the low seismic recordings. There's all sorts of other things, and toasty cars, of course, is one of the favorite things. And then in the second part, I talk about other um, pieces of information, other data that shows more about what technology is involved. 
But remember, you first have to establish what happened. Lack of debris. Again, if over a million tons of debris slammed the ground, you'd see a pile of debris left over. All right, you go to work on a nice September morning. And there's, there's Tower 1, there's Tower 2, and you work down here in Bankers Trust. So you're going to go into your office there in Bankers Trust, and then you're going to look out the window and see what you can see. Down here, you look out the window. What's it going to look like? That's looking out that window. Air-conditioned office, looking across the street, and whoops, where did the building go? This is right after 9-11. Tower 2 is basically missing. Tower 1 is missing over there. There's just, I think everyone would have to agree there's not enough stuff left on the, piled up on the ground. So again, it's, we're looking out there. Now we're going to look the other direction. And there's this main body goes missing. It's just the north wing is left. The building just went missing. That's building four. It was a nine-story building. So this is what was there beforehand, and it just basically all went away. And then a satellite image shows you know, all sorts of holes that were in those buildings. You know, the middle part of building six is gone. It looks like a post hole digger corded out. You have holes over here in Liberty Street. Even some holes in Vessie Street. And notice again that North Wing is remaining, but the main body's gone. And this is Bankers Trust where you're looking out the window seeing a non-building across the street. A few people talk about this building. It's a 22-story skyscraper. Well, it would be the tallest building in most small towns. It went away except for that last little corner. And Building 7 over here as well. Every building with the WTC prefix was destroyed that day. So we're going to look at this Direction. Now, a lot of people talk about hearing uh, the BBC announce early that Building 7 went away. Well, they, CNN did the same thing for one Liberty Plaza, but it's still there. It, it, they just get excited and want to be the first to report. And we're going to go down and look on the ground and see what it looks like down in here. Looking at the front door of Tower 1. So here we are down on the ground. There's Tower 1, the north and south walls. Ambulance, it was parked in front of the front door of Tower 1. It doesn't look clobbered by anything. This picture, I believe, was taken on 9-11, later in the day. I don't see any big steel beams on the ground. There's aluminum cladding. The towers were built with steel columns on the outside that were covered with aluminum cladding. And you see the aluminum cladding. The ambulance looks pretty good. This was the day after 9-11. Peter Jennings in the studio. I don't know if you heard a little earlier uh, me raise this question, which was asked, actually raised by ABC's Jackie Judd, as we look at these areas down below, and the video of where the towers used to stand and where is all the rubble gone. And have you, have you been able to, and is there any way you can answer that question? I'm sorry, Peter, I didn't get the question. Okay, I apologize. Jackie Judd and several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. And one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. <laughs> this is vital information. 
I really feel for, for George Stephanopoulos. He, he's got this job telling the world what's going on there, and that's the best he could do. And we humans tend to keep asking questions until we're given an answer. We don't stop to think if the answer makes sense. So he, what he has, is telling us is that it's obvious there's a big lack of material there. And here's an elevation map of what was left. And you see building four went missing, the holes in building six. Here's a firefighter in stairwell B. I heard this very, very loud noise above me. Uh, it was just a tremendous roar. Right down here, while and, that picture was uh, taken. It was above, and uh, it sounded like it was coming towards towards you. And uh, and then the wind, a very, very fierce wind, and my, my, my help started lifting me up off the ground. And so that's when I crouched down. All I, The next thing I I just crouched down. I got to the corner of the staircase by the railing, and I just got as small as I could possibly get. You know, I just because I'm not a big guy to begin with, so fortunately I'm not. Uh, so I got in a, and I literally, well, I guess the best way to describe it, I try to crawl into my fire helmet. I, that's that's what I wanted to do, just to protect myself. And uh, I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought the building might be coming down, and I figured. Uh, Okay, this could be it, you know. I mean, uh, and I was a little angry. I, I got, uh, I just, you know, it was like, damn it, like, why me? Why, you know, I'm just beautiful. I'm going to die in the World Trade Center on a beautiful summer morning. I just, it's like a little denial and disbelief sets in. And uh, nah. so then I started getting hit with stuff. You know, it was just debris was hitting me. And uh, I got, it went dark. And then the next thing was just total silence, nothing, no wind. No noise, no light, nothing. And then I started hearing noises. I started hearing like moaning and guys were starting to communicate, yell out. These were the guys that I was trapped with. Uh, they're calling out, who's there? You guys are right, blah, 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 and this kind of thing. And I realized I was other people. I wasn't alone, you know. Because you, when you're alone in a situation like that, they talk, it's like existential isolation. It's like, <laughs> and then when you find out you're with other people, it, 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 it makes you feel a lot better. Even though you know you're in a very bad situation, at least there's other people. But then the strangest thing happened. This beam of sunlight came right in on us, like about eight inches long, but it was clearly sunlight. It was all dirty, full of uh, debris. And it, was like, it looked like pepper was floating around in it, sort of. But it was sunlight, and I'm like, I'm like amazed now. It's <laughs> a 110-story building above us, and I'm looking up at the sun. <laughs> he was right at the base of this But building. when you came out, you had no idea where you were. There was no way to tell north, south, east, west. It was just the whole, the whole, all the, uh, all the, the whole atmosphere was full of debris and papers and smoke and, and there was no landmarks. There was no way to make a reference point. There was no, you couldn't see the sun anymore. The sun had gone away because the, the sun like that had come in, now it was gone. And uh, so there was no way to tell which way you were going. He was at the base of this building while this picture was being taken. And all 14 of them walked out on their own steam. Let's see. Here again is where they were. Jay Jonas was one of the ones with them. And said, I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us, and now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. Then later said, these are the bi biggest buildings in the world. And I didn't see one desk, one chair, one phone, nothing. Another survivor described walking out onto an empty football field. This is from the base here. This is what was there that went away. And that's where another 14 folks survived in that little stub at the end of that first building I showed. And they had that hole in building six where 50% approximately of building six was missing. 
and the main body of Building 4 went missing. Every time a floor hit another floor, it would not only make a noise, but it would cause tremendous vibration. So we're being bounced up and down off the floor, hearing this collapse coming closer and closer. Mickey Cross was caught on the second floor. My helmet started flying off my head. I had forgotten to snap my helmet. So I grabbed my helmet. I guess instinctually, I just pulled myself down the corner. The collapse of the North Tower created a massive rush of air. I was blown down six stories down to the, the first floor. And I, all I could remember while I was being blown down was, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. There wasn't any time to think about anything. The 110-story tower disintegrated in just 10 seconds. It was that fast, yet for me it was kind of slow motion too at the same time. And I remember thinking to myself, I said, oh shit, this is it, we didn't make it. Faced with what seemed like certain death, the trapped firemen thought their last thoughts and prepared to die. In those 10 seconds, I thought of, I was like, well, I'm 33, what have I done with my life? Worked almost all the time. My wife is gonna you know, be a widow now. Um, and I pretty much saw myself, I saw, pretty much saw my funeral. I saw everybody at the wake at my funeral and my parents and family there. You think about everything that's, everything I guess that you haven't done in your life. And you realize that, is this it? Are you gonna make it out of here? And I was just too young and I have too much more to do with my life than for this to be it. I thought I was gonna be dead in a few seconds. And I remember feeling, I, I hope, you know, this, I hope this is fast. Because <laughs> I had a, a fear of being trapped, like say with a broken back or severely injured and still being conscious and alive. It was strange, but I was at peace when the collapse actually started. I said, right, whatever's gonna happen now is gonna happen. And I hope it doesn't hurt too much, but, uh, but the fear was gone. The collapse of the North Tower killed over 1,300 people trapped inside the building. But some of the concrete walls encasing stairway B had remained intact, and enclosed within them, 14 people were still alive. As they opened their eyes, it seemed as if a miracle had happened. I could hear Mike. I could hear him groaning. I could hear him uh, called out to me. I called out to him, so I knew he was alive. You know, from the neck up, I seemed okay, but everything else was just like pins and needles. I mean, I was slapping my leg with my arm. I'm watching my arm hit my leg, but I can't feel it. I had my flashlight on my side, and I looked, uh, looked at my hands and looked at, you know, looked at myself to see if I was bleeding or anything anywhere. When he heard noises around him, Captain Jay Jonas realized he, too, had somehow survived the disaster. I wanted to know who was still alive and uh, I started calling them out by name. All the people in their group survived. That's a nice happy ending. But the descriptions they gave were not of a building falling on top of them, were not of bombs exploding around them. It wasn't high heat, they didn't get cooked. They didn't get squashed. The building just turned to dust above them. So we're gonna look now at what was left. If we go down below the ground in that corner, well, here's what it looked like. The building indeed, you know, the main body went missing. Just like it was sliced off there. So the mall is in the first story below ground. And there's some some firefighters that were walking along there. We're gonna go down one story and look at them. It was a perspective. Here they are. That's right under that area. It's a little bit punched in down here, 
But you can read innovation, luggage, Hallmark cards, so you know right where they are. So now we're going to go a couple of stories below that to the loading docks. And it's right below there is where they're walking, but the loading docks look from up above. And it's painted purple under building five, so you know where you are, and then green under building four. So it's color coded so the delivery trucks know where to unload. And we're going to look down that direction. Just after 9 11. Listen to the echo in this audio clip. Going down to the parking garage. We're in quite deep. These are the first pictures of search crews underneath the World Trade Center desperately looking for survivors. That's not a collapsed parking garage. That's not even a full parking garage. It's an empty parking garage. And we had this left. You can see remains of Tower 1. Stairwell B where those guys survived and it's all at ground level. There was a lot of dirt brought in. We were able to move 120 dump trucks out of the city last night, which will give you a sense of the work that was done overnight. Uh, so some of the debris has already been removed. More of it is being removed, and it'll be done by barge all throughout the day today. Did you think it was going to get cleaned up in one day? Again, here's the ambulance picture and, and all that was left. Where's the debris of a million tons of, of building? One of the other survivors said this. You know, we, we kept telling him we're in you know, third, stairwell, third floor, fourth floor, stairwell B, North Tower. Where are you? North Tower, stairwell B. Where are you? Stairwell B, North Tower. Don't you know where North Tower is? <laughs> they didn't know where the North Tower was because there was nothing left. And do you blame them? Here's right where those guys were, up in that little corner. Hundreds more firemen were now arriving at the disaster area, but Captain J. Jonas's Mayday messages were still not getting through. Trapped down in the remains of Stairway B, there was nothing else Jay could do. We realized we can't get ourselves out. And uh, that's a big mental leap for a fireman to take, because we're so used to being the people who are going in to rescue someone. Now, the roles are reversed and you realize you're helpless yourself. But with the survivors buried alive beneath a debris field that extended over 16 acres, it seemed they would need another miracle to save them. It was midday on 9-11 and in the chaos and confusion, Captain J. Jonas's Mayday messages were still not being received. The firemen had no idea there was a pocket of survivors nearby. Then Jay again tries to make radio contact. Unexpectedly, this time, his call is picked up. One of the officers coordinating rescue operations is Chief Nick Visconti. He responds to Jay Jonas's Mayday call. I got a, a radio transmission from Nick Visconti. I heard operations post to ladder six. Operations post to ladder six. This is Jay, where are you? Okay, 10 4. North Tower, stairwell B is in boy on the second floor. But the location Jay gave was unbelievable to them. The North Tower no longer existed. They asked for his location again. He asked me that a couple times, and one time he asked me that. Somebody else got on the radio and said, Where's the North Tower? I remember somebody saying that. Where's the North Tower on the radio? And I said, Oh, shit. I says, This... It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I 
What I like about these clips that, from the BBC's show about the miracle and stir well be is that these are the original people. They're telling their story. Indeed, they're real people, and they were trapped in there and walked out. And what they experienced, can you imagine being at the base of a 110-story building and the building goes away and you're left alive? There's also a fellow who remained at the edge of that hole in building six. His buddies didn't make it, they were a few feet away. There's stairwell B. And just to look at the amazing aspect of this, you get the uh, bare sidewalk over here. Building seven, a 47-story building, didn't even fully spill across the street. If you had a big building coming down like that, even with explosives in it, it'd be like uh, machine gun fire on all the adjacent buildings. Didn't happen. And that this dome doesn't look clobbered. It's right across the street. You don't see that debris piled up on the ground. This is right at ground level. So now we're going to talk about the bathtub. I don't know what the lighting is. If the building crashed to the ground, Manhattan would have been flooded because that dike around the bathtub would have been ruptured. And all of the path train tunnels and subway tunnels are all connected underground and they would all have been flooded. That didn't happen. Here are the towers before they built across the street. There was just water right there at the base of the towers. And the towers go well below the water table. There's also the rail lines that come under the Hudson up into the base of the bathtub. That tunnel was not damaged. First they, they were worried because they had water in the tunnel, but they had fire hoses on it, rainwater going in there. But once they pumped it out, it stayed dry. That's the bathtub wall, it's called, or slurry wall, or dike, whatever you want to call it. It keeps out the Hudson River. The towers were actually built in the Hudson River 70 feet below the water table. That's seven times 10. So they're pretty far down there. And if that thing had been ruptured, lower Manhattan would have been flooded. And here's the Hudson River and there's, as they're constructing it, you can see way deep down in there is the base, down there in bedrock. The, the path trains from the Jersey side used to come up through here and back out, but they rerouted them to turn around in that, the new big bathtub. Uh, I thought the seismic data you were going to look at was data associated with the collapse of the tower, particularly the tube. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, we did look. We, I mean, obviously, we have looked at all of the seismic signals. Um, the the main focus of that was to establish the timing of the various events, uh, and and if any, uh, uh, again, using it also to see if there were any um, any events that we could not explain other than it being the collapse of the of the towers and and the World Trade Center Seven. Uh, the, the signals strength due to the collapse of the towers were not of any magnitude that was seismically significant from an earthquake design standpoint or from the design or failure of a structural component or of, I would say, a piping system that might be used in a structure. So uh, there wasn't anything that gave us uh, pause in terms of that being a significant seismic event uh, to have ruptured the pipeline. This was a meeting that NIST had to, to determine what happened to Building 7. So they're wondering if there's any pipelines that went through the bathtub over to Building 7. And it, it, he said it wasn't seismically significant enough to have ruptured a pipeline to cause any damage. You have two buildings, half a million tons each, slamming to the ground, and it's not a seismically significant event. And the bathtub's fine at the end of the day. Tower 1's base is right here, down the bedrock. There's the old parking garage, after they cleaned it out. And 
if the buildings had slammed to the ground, the seismic signal would have shown it. Didn't happen. Michael Ober said, I don't remember the sound of the building hitting the ground. Somebody told me it was measured on the Richter scale. I don't know how true that is. If the building's hitting the ground that hard, why do I not remember the sound of it? It's amazing. And uh, somebody who worked in the 27th floor was decided to go home because he wasn't going to get anything done that day. He went down to um, the, the ferry terminal, the south end of the island, and some idiot, they thought, came running up and said, the tower just collapsed. And thought, That's ridiculous. They didn't hear it. They didn't feel it. When they walked past the tower, it looked like it was in good shape. Well, I think I know why it didn't make a sound. That part of the building doesn't make a thud when it hits. Dust gradually settles, and that's a lot of dust. This is an earthquake that happened earlier that year, in January of 2001, in Manhattan. So we know that the bedrock that the tower sat on can carry a seismic signal. But here's what Tower 1, the signal it made. Notice the difference in the quality. This is very high frequency. The lines are very closely spaced compared to this. Also, it has this, I call it the snout leading up to the, the big signal. It, it has that leading portion, which is the primary wave. The, the P wave arrives first, and then the secondary wave arrives. This is neither a P wave or an S wave. This is only a surface wave. P wave and S wave travels through the Earth. In other words, when the tower, during the tower's demise, the signal did not travel through the Earth. Again, that's the January 17th uh, earthquake. And here's, P wave is like a rubber band snap, and the S wave is like a jump rope. And the rolling surface, like getting up off a mattress in the morning, the, the mattress springs back up. If you remove two 500,000 ton buildings, you're gonna create a surface wave. But it only lasted eight seconds. You know it takes nine and a half seconds to throw a bowling ball off the roof of the towers and have it hit the ground? So, how, does, how can this be? The building couldn't have reached the ground as a solid, rigid object. Here's where tower, tower 2 had already gone by the time this chart started. Tower 1's demise there. But here we're going to focus on building 7, down here. There was an earthquake in the Fox Islands by the Aleutian Islands, and that's what the mess is after that. But where this vertical red line is, there's no seismic event that shows up at the scale. Nothing that stands out from background noise. For a 47-story building's demise? This is the King Dome. So here's a controlled demolition. And it produces a P wave and an S wave. So what length of time does that take? Uh, it takes, for, for a free fall speed from the roof to the ground, it's about four seconds. But the portion of time that the ground shook was more than twice that. So that doesn't answer the question either of what we saw. And with Building 7, what is very telling is that they calculated when the P wave and the S wave should have arrived because they could not pick it out from background noise. They couldn't even pick out where the surface wave arrived at, at one of these stations. So there's five different stations reporting and they had to calculate when the S wave and P wave would have arrived and it, and it was not there. The signal did not travel through the earth. So if we have the Seattle Kingdom, we're going to look at things relative to that. That made a 2.3 on the Richter scale when it was blown up by controlled demolition. 
and we have these two towers. Let's say for the t tower two is the first to go. So if we turn it to dust, all but the bottom 16 stories, and then drop a 16 story building to the ground, we record approximately the same seismic signal as what was recorded on 9-11. Just pretend this rust doesn't exist. And for Tower 2, if you turn it into dust above the 20th story and just drop a 20-story building to the ground, you get the seismic signal that was recorded. And for Building 7, it's all but the bottom two and a half stories. Where's the rest of the building? It makes a 0.6 on the Richter scale. That's like a, a jackhammer. It should have sounded like it was raining dump trucks. You know, big dump trucks go down the road, they, they wake you up at night because they vibrate the ground. So, we've talked about these three things. Now we're going to talk about dustification and, and lather. You'll notice I use a unique language. If you don't know what the phenomenon is, and you use the name of a known phenomenon, that's wrong. You're misleading the direction the information is going in. You're, you're calling something uh, like fire when it's not fire. It, that's why I use the word fumes, because if you use smoke, you're assuming the cause to be fire. If you don't know what the phenomenon is, better not use a name of a known phenomenon. Well, what happened to these buildings? That's a phenomenon we've never seen before. It needs a new name. I call it dustification. The buildings turn to dust. It's not a difficult word to, re to remember either. And often I use names of food, you know, like, like uh, Cheetos or something like that. You're not going to confuse this with food. It's better than using characteristic 493-7A. You're not going to remember that. But we're going to talk about dustification. As we talked about before, this is turning to dust as it falls. People often see these, these uh, squirts ahead of the collapse wave. But what was that? If it's bombs, you'd see a flash and you'd see a whole lot more of them. But if you have the whole building turning to dust as it comes apart, what about the water tanks that are distributed throughout the building? They're going to get weaker and weaker as they're dissolving until they suddenly give way. And I'm tempted to believe that, that that might indeed be what that is. We don't know. But if you've got that whole building down on the ground in like eight seconds, well, let's say nine and a half seconds just to give it some extra, it would have to be squirting out here at the base at a minimum of Mach 1.5. The air from the middle to get to the outside is like Mach 2.5. For sure, all of the adjacent buildings should look like they were machine gun fired. That's a lot to stuff to squirt out of the way. And that's assuming the building took, you know, nine and a half seconds to come to ground. So you just have those couple little puffs. Something's not right there, too. Now, people who say, okay, we heard, they, they claim they heard explosions. And so therefore, it must be bombs in the building. They're starting with assuming what did it, and then going back to assuming what problem they're solving, instead of determining first what happened. Well, if you recall, um, blasting zone ahead, you know, turn off cell phones and two-way radios just in case it triggers something. How are you going to get everyone to unknowingly turn off all their cell phones in southern Manhattan for weeks ahead while they prepare the site? But there were sounds of explosions. Bombs go boom, but not everything that goes boom is a bomb. Think of putting an egg in your microwave oven. Turns out there's a lot of folks who talked about these Scott packs exploding at ground level, sitting on the fire trucks. There's a lot of testimony here, we don't need to go over it, but there's various firefighters who talked about hearing these Scott tanks exploding. Now this is slow motion of Tower 1 coming apart. And you notice this, uh, there'll be some uh, column that starts falling down this, this corner. 
I think it's in here. And we're going to follow it down and watch how it just turns to dust completely. And as well as these other, other things. Here it is. Okay, it's got the dust trailing behind it. This is a solid piece. It's like ice cream melting. It's going away. And if you focus on various other parts, you'll see the same thing. There's no sound with this. This is a high-speed version. You can see that piece again. And these big chunks over here. You see it's turning to dust as it comes down. And we're going to go look down on the ground right next to where this was coming down. This is the Verizon building here. Whoops, right here. And we're going to look at the corner right below there. That's the Verizon building right there. This is that intersection where that material was falling. Right after everything settled, these people who were hiding come out of their hiding places. And they're probably in awe. There's you know, no building here. You can see sky. Looking at the body language, the guy with his hands on his hips, arms folded, arms that side. They're, they're probably in, in total amazement and shock and just bewildered. I call this picture the twilight zone because they probably felt like they just walked into the twilight zone. A bunch of cars went into spontaneous combustion, apparent spontaneous combustion up here with a sea of unburned paper in between. And here is uh, that toasted car lot. But we're going to look at various directions of watching this dustification. There's a cluster of core columns that remains here. Watch what happens to them. They just faint. I believe that's the upper part of where those firefighters survived in stairwell B. Those are core columns. This is another one. See how it peels away like a banana. And you see this clear air around it. Some folks like to say dust settled on it. Well, dust can't settle on something like that that fast without seeing it. And this from across the river, you can see those, those two. And then there's a sequence from the northern view. And you know, my detractors like to say, oh, it fell over. And because the dust was so fine, it hung in the air. Well, if the dust is so fine, it hung in the air, how could it be settled instantly on these vertical columns? We saw how it was peeled away like a banana. But it comes a point where it's no longer a crisp boundary and just turns to dust. I call it dustification. I mean, where have we seen it before? It goes one more round. But you're told to see a collapse, so you tune that out. You can see all of this just frothing up into dust. That part. And it's also blowing downward. Very clean edges. So it isn't like dust was settling on it. Another part of it, this is further up than this image, because this is coming down close to this building. But notice there's some 
chunks that go missing. And notice the dust kind of squirting out the ends of those pieces. You can see it trailing. Is there a reason why it didn't, you didn't hear a thud when it hit? Lather is a term I use when it looked like a unique, another unique um, behavior pattern, but I think lather is just the, the part doing the same thing that this is doing, but doing it in place. And this video is of building seven, the north face, but notice it's one face and one face only that has this uh, lather pouring out of it. No, no, go low to the corner. Notice it's spiraling around. And if, if, the, uh, if it was smoke from a fire and it really needed to get out, why isn't it coming out these windows? If there's a traffic jam, you know, why does it take the path of least resistance? The wind that day was seven or eight miles an hour. No, no. Go low to the corner. Now we're going to look at dust rollout and fuzz balls. This wall of dust is pouring down the street. It was chasing people and it overtook them. Didn't cook them. Just left them covered with dust. You know, I like these abrupt lines. Like you can see where this uh, other fellow's tie it was tucked in there. He was just covered. He didn't get cooked. The dust went a certain distance and then went up. Another bizarre thing. Again, it's important just to take in all of the data and it starts telling you the story of what happened. Let the evidence tell you the story instead of forcing it to go a particular direction. And I wouldn't have seen this before. That just all particular distance then goes up. There's a video filmed by Bob and Bree who had an apartment up here. Bless them for... for saving this video and then sharing it with the world. This is an image from there, and the dust doesn't quite touch their window, and then goes up. Eastern time this morning here in New York City, a plane crashed into the Wayne Twin Tower. 
the World Trade Center about two Isn't that amazing? It goes up. Now, controlled demolition, the dust doesn't really go above the highest point of the building, the original building. But this went up and blocked out all the sunlight for a few minutes. And it went up and continued going up. And continued going up for months and years. Wet tire tracks, they wet it down, they're misting it from oops, up here. But what's this? Wet dirt? All right, fuzzballs. Notice how clear the air is from here on up. But down at the bottom is a thick haze. And you'll notice from the time on the clock that it's only 15 minutes after the South Tower went away. And this is 15 minutes before the North Tower went away. How could that fine of dust have landed in that short of time? It's fallen out of the air because it's clear. And there's several other pictures that indicate this, that it was coarse dust that landed and then became fine dust and began rising up like it kept breaking down. Toasted cars, we've got to get to the toasted cars. I say they're toast, they're history. I can't say they're burnt because I don't know that. But they're toast. I just decided to use that word to say something happened, messed them up. You can't fix it, you've got to get a new one. It's, it's, it's history. This is a police car found on FDR Drive. I don't know how it got to, I don't know where it was toasted. There were some that were witnessed as being toasted on FDR Drive. But this one is quite interesting in that it uh, has an abrupt, you know, toasted, not toasted. Like, it's, it's like it's on the showroom floor. It just had a new wax job back there. What abruptly stops? A real fire, a regular fire, doesn't do that. It would be lapping around the corner. Also, why aren't the lights melted? And you have the circular spot on the other side. Gas tank is still, you know, fine. This is where all the toasted cars were seen that, that I'm aware of, as well as the toasted car lot. And the ones we were looking at were down here. And an emergency medical person said you could tell it was hot at the Trade Center because you could feel the heat from the bridge. But paper wasn't burning down here. How could somebody over here, three quarters of miles away, feel heat? Something that they perceived as heat. And you said you saw melted tour buses, melted cars? The cars that were right down there, it was just unbelievable. They were twisted and melted into nothing. The, build, the debris is just unbelievable. And then you can see fire trucks and police vehicles that were down there early, that um, all their windows, the windshields are completely blown out. From Must have been from when debris dropped. But even more jarring, I think, uh, is this scene right here. Look at these two cars placed on top of one another. I think when you, when you think about the impact that uh, these planes must have had, it's hard to, to visualize know what to say. Um, it, because everything melted. But here, at least you have some remnants. You have literally an engine uh, that is melded together with other parts of the car. Moving over, you've got another car they moved here. It looks like it's been through a war. Uh, you can see uh, the papers, all the... Paper. Uh, the burned out papers from the building, <laughs> you see the soot and the dirt, and it just shows you how devastating this blast was. Look across the street there, uh, you've got a Con Ed uh, truck that, you know, some of the Con Ed people now looking at, examining, trying to figure out uh, which truck that actually was, but that truck too, uh, in terrible shape. Uh, so, while many of the uh, items, the steel, uh, was literally melted. People who have been right down next to the base of what was the trade towers say there's virtually nothing. Yes, we'll stop here on this uh, toasted bus picture. And realize there's no burnt marks, no, no scorch marks on the toasted bus. But yeah, these poor reporters, they're doing the best they can. <laughs> Remember, the evidence is the truth that a theory must mimic if a theory is correct. Starting out with a theory, uh, if you haven't figured out what happened first, you're just solving an imagined problem, not a real problem. So it's so important to look at the evidence. As we've seen, 
the evidence is showing us a different story than what we were led to believe. Now this uh, toasted bus, notice there's no big flame marks running up the side of the bus. No scorch marks. This is that going? Oh. <clears throat> and then we have also uh, this vehicle that's already rusted. You can see building seven is still standing. Every car up this road was toasted in some way. Every vehicle. I call this the swamp. I think you can see why. Is it the sound? Oh, yeah. No door handles. Yeah. Not a trace of, of window glass. Just gone. Go, let's go. Go. Uh, three, two. Oh, man. Fine. More debris falling from a nearby building, the World Trade Center. We're at West Broadway and Barclay. Very difficult to breathe here, but look around. This must have been ground zero where this thing blew up. Car after car after car. Buses completely obliterated and burned straight down to the steel. Behind me. Uh, he's, he was describing it the best he could. Here's more of that street. And notice no door handles. Now that in itself isn't surprising, but we're just noticing the patterns. It seems that door latches, you know, trunk lid latch, this door, uh, trunk, door latches and door handles were, were completely gone. Also, this looks like uh, it was sandblasted ready for a new paint job. Not a trace of window glass left in that. And that's what seems to be a trend with the toasted vehicles. Something happens to the engine compartment too, like this one down here. And notice again this uh, distinct abrupt line between different parts of the car. Now, often folks say, well, that's just like any old burnt car. Here are burnt cars up at the top. Notice these rings of burn marks around it. And burnt cars also have remains of window glass. This is clean and down here. And here we have traces of window glass left. And of course there's a lot left there. But the ones on 9-11, there's not a trace, the ones who are, that are seriously toasted. Doesn't look at all, these are uniform colors, like they've been sandblasted, ready for a new paint job. And insides are completely toasted. I think they threw this stuff in afterwards. But the stuffing is still partly here in the burnout car. So there's a bunch of cars that appear to go into spontaneous combustion up in that parking lot. <clears throat> and we have various views of that and my detractors often say well the cars were towed you know, they, they were burned elsewhere and were just towed through junkers but we have photos of them before, during and after now here's the toasty car see how there looks like this flame coming out of them but the sea of unburned paper in between the, the buildings over here the towers and here again is tower still standing. And there's the untoasted cars that haven't been toasted yet. And there they are, they haven't been toasted yet. They're still in good shape. I actually thought this car was white, but I was surprised to find it was black. And here, st it's still in good shape. People are evacuating. Here it is after it's been toasted. They can't tell it was a black car. <laughs> just all in a line, they just went poof. Weird fires, I can't call them a fire because there's weird things with them like paper not burning. 
This is where I call the swamp. I've toasted cars all along through there. And the fellow who came out that door, he's probably the one that left it open, walked up West Broadway and it was pitch black. And then he said, thank goodness, the car started lighting up because then he could see where he was going. He walked out of there up to intersection C and turned over towards D. And intersection along there, the paper's not burning. Here's the firefighters going for a lunch break. And they come, doo doo doo. You know. They don't seem at all concerned that they're walking through this fire. They aren't worried about a car blowing up. Now, this is an interesting picture. Often, we were shown this by uh, certain individuals who would say, see, molten metal. But wait a minute, what's really going on here? This is a, an igloo cooler and a trash can that aren't melted. If this is white hot, then it's got to be you know, hot enough that it's going to melt this aluminum. Aluminum melts at around 660 centigrade. And it's a kind of a barely a, a beet red. You have to be like a thousand degrees centigrade in order for it to glow. So when aluminum's glowing and it's not a puddle, something else is going on. So we're told about uh, pools of molten metal. Well, that's paper, not burned. Aluminum is blood red when it, when it melts. Oops. I don't know what that is. Again, remember this temperature. And up here is where you need it to be, well above where aluminum melts. But you see this aluminum cladding appears to be glowing on the end. This corner up here. And you get these, I call them Cheetos. And in case people don't know what Cheetos are, they, you know, little orange thing on the ground, and you're not going to confuse that with a piece of steel. But there's these little things that look like Cheetos that are, that are glowing. Pretty strange. The firefighters reporting molten metal like a slurry Here's or a steel me. mill or a volcano. Those are quotes. Well, Giant what pools. About, what about the pictures of them dragging oxygen hoses all over the steaming supposed hot metal? If it were that hot, you wouldn't dare do that, would you? <laughs> would you? Oh, well, we do have the infrared uh, photos of the uh, molten metal. Well, uh, again, what, what melted the metal? Was it heat? Or was it something else? Here on this uh, thermal map that is so often quoted, point E is right next to where building three had been. Here's point E. According to the measurement there, it's supposed to be 819 Fahrenheit. That's above 212, the word water boils. This guy doesn't look like a boiled chicken. Yeah, how hot can that be? So the, the color in that map meant something else. It wasn't temperature. And nice bushy trees didn't melt. But, or didn't burn, neither did the paper in the street. But what happened to these vehicles? What happened to his engine? And where that firefighter walked up the street and turned the corner, here's right where he turned the corner. Again, you have these Cheetos on the ground whatever they are. What's strange is, is the uh, fire on the side of the van in front. And again, it was a different contrast. You can see it's just on the side of the van. What's burning? This shows uh, the apparent spontaneous combustion. This is during the cleanup. You see that thing that flashed over there? There's another slow motion clip of it. You'll see it over here somewhere. Oh, there it goes. Just apparent spontaneous combustion.
This is a clip where they talk about hot steel toed boots. Up to 10 times a night, often until 2 in the morning, delivering whatever it is rescue workers need to do their jobs, like the ones working in the hot spots. Steel toed boots is one of the biggest things. Um, steel toed boots? Steel toed boots. Out still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours um, and they're burning their feet. That story was repeated again and again and again. People assumed it was proof that it was hot. When my steel oven melts, the turkey inside is more than well done. So how can you have steel-toed boots melting and there's no reports of burned feet? What I, how I hear that is the boots were coming apart. They're disintegrating. Someone suggested it was because of heat. And people just ran with that story. It was the best, you know, the only answer they got to the question, so they ran with it. But something was, was likely happening to those boots coming apart. But you can't walk around on a, on a barbecue grill without burning, you know, if it's that temperature. Mayor Giuliani. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I could be standing here, and you could be standing there, and I could be describing to you, Governor, the, the, the site, and then a fire would break out in between us. And uh, it was just by luck or the design of God that we weren't killed. He was standing on 2,000 degree temperature pile. Uh, he doesn't mean to be sounding like an idiot. He was describing something that he experienced and that was the best explanation he could give. Weird spontaneous, apparent spontaneous combustion. So here we are down to the rolled up carpets. We'll see why I call it that. At the end of the, of the day, you have these uh, straight soldiers here. If you have buckling from overload, doesn't it bend over? Doesn't it bend around the horizontal axis? Why is, it, why is everything straight? If you overload these outer columns, they're going to bend. If you mash something down real hard, it's going to bow out. Yet what we have, instead of having it uh, bend over, is curling around the vertical axis. Here's a cluster of three columns. And this lasagna noodle, see, you can't confuse that with a piece of food, but it emphasizes the fact that this is a loading that does this. Something else happened to this. This is straight. It curled around the vertical axis, not the horizontal axis. How do you get something to bend more than 180 degrees and not even crack? It's a smooth bend and it splits at the seams. This is a very interesting one. I'd like to have somebody, you know, an engineer who claims that that's normal, draw me a free body diagram and show me the loading to put on that beam to make it do that. You know, it's not like a rubber band that recoils. If it's hot and it's flowing, it doesn't have the strength to recoil. So how do you explain this crinkling up, like curling ribbon? Now that's what buckled beams look like. They don't do that. They see through holes there. It just happened that one place. This was found in Banker's Trust. Banker's Trust was determined to have not had any fires in it. So we're going to begin the proof of concept. Okay, here's what we found at the World Trade Center. And here's something that John Hutchison bent. It's molybdenum. It's not, it's not cracked in the corners either. Smooth curling. When I first contact, contacted John Hutchison, I sent him this picture and said, um, does your neighborhood ever get to looking like this? Because you have this toasted vehicle here, and the one in front is parked in the right place, but it's just got the tires in the wrong direction. You know, it's not oriented correctly. 
And notice all the marble around the doorway is gone. The rest of the building, there's no stab wounds in the building, no big beams went flying through. Another weird thing is the uh, window glass. Sometimes just the outer pane's broken. A rock doesn't do that. Evidence of levitation. So power came down, I was across the street, and I picked up the camera just out of habit. And something in the back of my mind said, run, run, run. And never in 20 years of shooting in New York have I run from an assignment. But something in the back of my head just said, run. And as I hit the corner of Liberty Street, um, it was almost being picked up by a tornado, almost being picked it's up like by a wave. It was like being picked up with a black cloud. It, that black it, cloud yeah. had substance. Mm. It was like night, but it had yeah. had a solid feel to it. It was like gravel, hot gravel, mm. and just picked me up and tossed me about a block. I just, at one second I was running, and the next second I was airborne. And I, I, I lost my glasses, I lost my cell phone, I lost my pager, but managed to hold on to both cameras. Mm. But it threw you for a block? I was back down at Ground Zero last week and walked the area where I have a pretty good recollection of where I was and where I wound up, and it was it was just under it was just under a city block. And it was this blast of warm air. It wasn't hot. It was warm, and it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building that was. You were picked up off the ground. Physically picked up off the ground. I remember an explosion. At that point, I got knocked out. I don't remember anything. Then I got up, and I looked out the window because the windows exploded, and the street below caved in. upside down. The, appear, the cars appeared to be either flipped or toasted. Now let's consider something else here. John Hutchison's work, he's got water drifting up. Levitation of water. Now we'll come back and talk about the weather. We need to talk about the weather, right? Someone thought it was a nice beautiful day well, it was right directly above Manhattan, but not a few miles off the East Coast. See, it's as nice as can be. Here's Geraldo Rivera, morning. who's chased you know, out hurricanes for 40 I years. I've been so attracted over the years to hurricane coverage, but it, it, there's risk involved. There is, uh, you know, the peril of not knowing what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that adventure, and it's pitting yourself against the, an enemy. It's like war, only no one is shooting at you specifically. Uh, yeah, that's what the allure, but there is an, an area storm that I am not, that I, the juices don't flow, and you yeah. look and check it out. Remember that? Remember that? When that? Oh. I watched oh, that live. Well, that live, too. <laughs> and maybe a storm or on YouTube, uh, you know, uh, you got to get up close okay? and personal. And Which, the, this is Hurricane Ike, I think. Uh, that was recent. That was, uh, wasn't this uh, Rita? You would know. You know what I think it was, Rita? Is it? Rita in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Galveston. Oh, no. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously Katrina before that changed so many of our histories. It was so, so traumatic. You know, and it's well, one funny thing I think of. I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9-11. Remember, they didn't, knew mm -hmm. how, they didn't know how to use instruments, the mm -hmm. terrorists. They, they took off in Boston, right. and they literally, after they took over the aircraft, they steered by line of sight. And it was that crystal clear September day. Sure was. Yeah. And if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten. And I think about that a lot now, and especially this time of year. So, are you still, we're the peak of hurricanes. Yeah. You, this uh, was just two years ago. Well, I don't know about that. Here's an, here again, you're asking us to deal with a fact I'm not aware of. I never heard about flames or fumes. I mean, fumes coming out of a building. I'll tell you what. Let me go to, first of all, let me go to Steve in Florida. Steve in Florida, you're on the air. Go ahead, please, with Dr. Judy Wood. Hi, Joy. Thank you for taking my call. Am I sure. loud and clear? Yeah, you are. Go ahead. Judy, you have misrepresented the facts concerning Hurricane Aaron. I live here in Hurricane Country, Florida. I track all the hurricanes. Aaron hit Corpus Christi, Texas, 15 August 2007. Your opinion concerning 911 are not consistent with the facts provided on 911 ripple effect. Last man out. Richard Gage's blueprint for truth. 
loose change final cut, zero, and investigation into 911, and many other video documentaries. I don't know what planet you've come from. Okay. I guess he's gone. I don't know what happened to Steve. Um, uh, as for Hurricane Aaron, they did not retire that name. It has been used several times. Uh, it was the uh, first hurricane, I believe, of the 2001 hurricane season. All right. Let me go back to George. George. Well, one funny thing I think of, I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9-11, and it was that crystal clear September day, sure was. You know. and if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten, and I think about that a lot. This is what was shown on television that morning of 9-11. This is where the hurricane was at that moment. See anything missing? <laughs> This this is where the hurricane was here. Where's your from where? What's your reference? Uh, the uh, the satellite, uh, the what? National Hurricane Center satellite images. That's Geraldo from that time. The rest is from 9/11. Yeah, Geraldo apparently didn't know there was a hurricane that day. And Joey Moore, a flight attendant on 9-11, who flew out of Boston's Logan Airport just before the, the fatal flight that left, did not know there was a hurricane either until he saw it on my website. But why, why didn't they mention it? That's the question. It, it, it begs the question, too. Yeah. Because you know how much they like to melt those for all they can get. They love to, to report on hurricanes. I'm not saying anything. I'm just noticing if um, if people didn't know there was a hurricane coming and you saw it was headed straight for New York, if it hadn't turned around when it did, Manhattan would have been flooded. And how fast can you evacuate that many people from Manhattan? Can you can you afford that risk unless you absolutely know there's no chance? Unless you you, you know, how would you know? The, it is. Uh, it does show up the National Hurricane Center's, you know, text forecasts. But they were very played down. They weren't shown on the media. People were not aware that there was a hurricane there. Oh, they took the ships out to sea because they knew that the hurricane was coming. They may have looked into the, the National Hurricane Center's reports, but it was not you know, something that was heavily publicized. It wasn't zero uh, publicity on it, but it was very underreported. I'm confused here. Are you saying that they actually moved the hurricane away? They had to um, the hurricane for four days was going in a straight line. And then on the morning of 9-11, it stopped, turned around, and that afternoon it started heading out of town. So you think that was artificially done? I'm just reporting what the evidence is. I don't want to guess, but I can say that that if they didn't know it for 100% sure that it was going to turn around, if there's any question, why weren't people told to evacuate? Just in case. Oh, because the people at the time were told to evacuate because of the hurricane? No. No. Nobody was told to evacuate because of the hurricane. That's the That's the puzzle, that nobody was really told about the hurricane being there. It just happened to be there and then turn around and left quietly. You know, we t we're told this is nice, wonderful September day. So but it could have been it could have been used. National Hurricane Center. I've, I've got all of the references in my book. And this is that uh, satellite image of the hurricane is from the National Hurricane Center. You can download it yourself. I'm just saying that I think it would, it would, it would help your presentation. Excuse me, drjudywood.com forward slash articles forward slash Erin 
You'll find five pages of multiply referenced data from the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, let's let Dr. Judy Wood get through her presentation. We've got plenty of time for questions afterwards. Thank you so much. So let's also look at some other information. Now, the hurricane was going to turn around at some point. They thought on day one it was going to turn around because it was a high-pressure system moving across the U.S., but then didn't. Well, maybe on day two it didn't. Maybe on day three it didn't. Maybe on day four. Thank goodness it did. They had predicted it was going to turn around all this time, but did they really know when? If they didn't know, they, didn't have, they ran out of uh, room. So <clears throat> here we have the high-pressure system moving in from the Midwest, and it's increasing, while the hurricane, which is a low-pressure system, is moving in from the Atlantic. And guess where they met and when? 10 a.m. on the morning of 9-11. They were superimposed at that area, so you have two counter-rotating systems, curiously. And interesting uh, drop with the, the uh, humidity, but let's look at this magnetometer information. This is the Earth's magnetic field from the ground, not from satellite, but from the ground. In Alaska, there's six different measurements. Each of the events on 9-11 are with a vertical bar. The first one is WTC-1 getting an airplane-shaped hole, and WTC-2, and then WTC-2 goes poof, WTC-1 goes poof, and then later, Building 7 goes poof. I say goes poof, they didn't collapse. They turn to dust. So it's interesting. It's pretty much a steady state, and something different happens here. There was a solar storm approaching, but it didn't get to that point until a day later. So there's something else going on here. A closer look, about 20 minutes before WTC-1 got its hole, that's the North Tower, they started wandering off of their average value. And as soon as WTC-1 got its hole, the, it reverses direction. As soon as WTC-2 gets its hole, it goes horizontally. It's like one reversed the other one. Maybe coincidence? And then uh, when WTC-2 goes poof, it, they start going downhill, but when WTC-1 goes away, it really drops off the cliff, and then things are all haywire all afternoon until... WTC-7 meets its demise. The Earth's magnetic field, as recorded at six different stations. Again, here's where they start wandering down. There's actually three different measurements for when the North Tower got its hole. The 9-11 Commission report, the Palisades Seismographic Station, and the NIST report. I can tell you which one's right based on where the turnaround happens. And see how these go horizontally after building two gets its hole. These are the, the six different recording stations. It's just, you know, a curious uh, set of data. Now we're going to get into the proof of concept. I can't say for sure how, the, what technology was used, but I can sh show you something that reproduces all of the same phenomena. Seen this guy, Nikola Tesla. He can generate all of these various um, pieces of evidence, all these different phenomena. So can John Hutchison. When he tried to replicate the work of Nikola Tesla, he discovered all of these characteristics. And all of those characteristics were found at the World Trade Center site. Let's notice this metal luminescence without heat. You know, hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. George Piggott got a patent just about 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago. Levitation. He's got a static field, and he's doing some other things with putting in some kind of energy, and he's got these static balls, I mean, these steel balls levitating. I think they're actually silver. And Thomas Townsend Brown also looked into the same area about using electricity. And then Ed Leedskallen, who 
built Coral Castle. Here's John Hutchison standing in front of the Great Pyramid. There's a person down here in the background. You can see they're almost two blocks tall. Well, that's about the same height as this doorway of Coral Castle. So they're about the same size blocks. They're 15 tons each. So uh, this guy built his castle by himself. We don't know how this one was built. We can only guess. Well, let's look at how uh, John Hutchison's more of work here. This is an iron block. It's two inches by two inches by seven inches tall, solid iron block. And when he puts it in his system, it buckles over and you can see some fuming here. And it actually is colder to the touch at the end of this. And here we get to see it happen. And we're going to compare it to the fuming door handles from 9-11. Is a door handle? Cold yep, it's a cold process. Solid iron. Now this fuming, which is interesting. You know, the, the, the car window is broken open here. We're going to look at some other things about the weird fires. I can't call them regular fire because I don't know that. The weird fire, just to note that it's not something that you know for sure what it is. It's glowing, but the paper doesn't seem to burn. If this was glowing because it's hot, it'd have to be at least, you know, 1,200 degrees centigrade. Aluminum melts at a little over 600 degrees centigrade. It's not a puddle. This aluminum is not a puddle, so uh, how hot can it be? And this igloo cooler and the plastic trash can are not melted. The paper is not burned either on the ground. So what is that color? And another weird thing about this, right across the street over here is Burger King. And inside they're flipping burgers, cooking burgers for the firefighters. Not serving to the customers, but, and then the building across the street was missing. It's just a weird sight. Now this van is also interesting that, you know, you get all this, this something looks like it's on fire, weird fires there. This van down here has a fire on the side of it. What's burning? And if you see falling debris that was on fire hit these vehicles, why didn't it hit anything else? And how's it, you know, under the vehicle? It's just very strange. This park, park place is several blocks north. Now here's John's boat experiment. Well, what it shows is when he turns off his gizmo, then the boat lights up with, with weird fires. And the cars lit up right after the tower's demise, not during, right after as though it was right after something got turned off. This is another interesting, you know, at the WTC, how these, this beam curled up. Actually, that was right across the street. That was in Banker's Trust. These are John Hutchison's samples. Notice there's no creases in the corners. I, I should have found the picture of holding this one like this. Yeah. Vitamins? <laughs> <laughs> But it, it curls up like that, like at room temperature. And this is a video that hopefully will run. There we go. It wiggles back and forth. Now watch this thing. It's going to come apart in here. It's starting to come apart. Weird things happen. Some other weird things that 
happen were roundish holes in the outer pane of windows. They weren't necessarily through both panes. That's strange. If you throw a rock through a window, it breaks the window because the window is brittle and it bends and, and brittle materials are weak in tension, so it shatters the glass. So how do you get a round hole without cracks running out? Turns out uh, somebody replicated that very thing. This is my analogy saying, okay, if you drop a rock in a pond, it ripples outwards. Maybe something like that is what ripples outwards with longitudinal waves that causes the glass to break in a rounded pattern. Now let's think about uh, hurricanes. What do they do? Well, Hurricane Andrew drove this two before through a tree. Piece of plywood. And with tornadoes, I'm sure you've all heard about straw through trees. It's not because they're flying fast. Something weird is going on. There's John Hutchison's sample with a butter knife and a piece of aluminum. He also has one with wood in the aluminum. If the wood, I mean, if the aluminum's hot enough to melt, the wood would have burned up. So it's strange. Now, when I found these, you can see the blow-ups. I wondered, why on earth would the car door be peeling split thickness? It's not a laminate structure. Didn't know what that meant, but it was definitely a category of data, and I put it aside. Later, when I found John Hutchison's work, wow, he can peel open extruded aluminum. That's not laminate, it's extruded. And we have these coins from the World Trade Center. People like to say they're melted together. I point out that zinc melts before copper does. It also boils before copper melts. So that would likely explode, but it's one of the lowest, zinc is one of the lowest melting point uh, materials. So what gives? What, why is this stuff stuck together? <laughs> and this is the only surviving file cabinet. It's from Ben and Jerry's ice cream store. Here's the piece of wood embedded in the aluminum from John Hutchison's work without elevated temperature. Same with these. WTC6 with these cylindrical holes in it. Well, here's John Hutchison's aluminum sample with cylindrical holes in it. It's as though there's a, a pencil line in space around which material at the same radius is dustified. And if you had a lot of those vertically here, you would end up with dustified cylindrical columns. But there's no way you could get a, a drill in there and turn it sideways. It's parallel to the surface, and it just starts right here. The end of this, this bar is solid. Let's look at some other similarities with hurricanes. Kind of like a big Tesla coil. And come to think of it, ahead of a storm system, people feel the storm coming. Birds know to head for cover. You can feel the static field ahead of the storm. Here's another thing about storm systems. I don't know if this needs a click or not. This um, is from this past spring in Texas where there's a bunch of tornadoes and you had flying trucks. It went across a, 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 a transport company, uh, trees flying through the air, semi, the, the, the trailers, there you go, a couple of semi, look at that, the beds of the trailers hurling, twirling around in the sky and then dropping down from at least 50 feet high down into the ground. We saw trees, there goes another semi. And it's Up, spinning. It's as spinning, it's... down it comes, bang, lands, lands on its nose right down at the ground. Big piece of uh, a tree there that just got hurled up, I believe it was. So uh, certainly we have seen a destructive tornado on the south side of Dallas, still within parts of the uh, area near south of Grapevine, uh, north of Arlington, a possible tornado in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex area, as well as over on the east side of uh, Dallas, uh, in toward the area around uh, the uh, Mesquite area, just to the west of Mesquite and east of Dallas. Those are flying trucks. 
I, I would say that's anti-gravity. It's not a vacuum. And people who've been picked up in funnel clouds can still breathe. Remember we saw before where, where people had been levitated during uh, WTC2's demise, or WTC1's. So here we have also uh, the front of Bankers Trust. This was the only non-WTC building that was severely damaged. It wasn't destroyed that day. They actually repaired it. Once they repaired it, they started taking it apart. Huh? They got it down to this level where they had repaired it in deconstruction. There. When they got it down to that level, that's the area that had been repaired. It looks like it's been at the bottom of the ocean for a hundred years. Extreme degradation. And it makes one wonder, is the, was the building continuing to disintegrate and that's why they had to take it down after they repaired it? It took them, hundred, uh, it took them ten years to take it apart. <clears throat> now we're going to look at tritium. Kind of interesting. It's usually something that comes from nuclear reactions. But here we don't find any of the um, ionizing radiation that you get with nuclear re reactions. Some aluminum with holes in it. Material is changing. This was a sample of dust from the Bankers Trust, that one they decided to take down. Look at all this zinc, the before and after. Like 3,500 times as much zinc from the control sample. Now we're going to look at John Hutchison's sample. He's got, uh, you know, we're, let's just look at the relative amounts. You have a lot of copper and much less zinc. This is for brass. In the affected region, you have about equal amounts of zinc and copper. Whoops. Give me the... Equal amounts of zinc and copper there. So... Uh, okay, if it's heat, with zinc having a much lower, it boils, it, it melts at 419 or 420, where copper melts at a much higher temperature. Zinc boils before copper even melts. So we don't have less copper because of heat, because the zinc would be the first to go. What's going on here? At Texas A&M, a group led by Professor John Bockris, who is widely regarded as one confusion. of the world's greatest electrochemists, reported finding the hydrogen isotope tritium, a key signature that some unusual nuclear reaction was going on. And, uh, the, the first thing was this, uh, this, this uh, thing called tritium, which was a, uh, a, a sub-form of hydrogen which should not exist uh, except in extremely tiny quantities. We found that by working these uh, cells of Fleischmann and Pons uh, containing lithium hydroxide and deuterium oxide, that we could produce this tritium in great abundance, let's say at uh, 10,000 times more than it ought to be there, as it were. And um, let, me, let me stress that we couldn't do it every time, but about one result in five or one result in four and eventually we worked up to two results out of three, um, we could produce tritium. That was the first thing, and, and in a way it was the first clear proof of the phenomenon. And, uh, but the most important and unbelievable phenomenon at that time was the observation of tritium. Back at Texas A&M, Bacchus's group found themselves under attack. Science magazine writer Gary Tobbs wrote a stinging article that insinuated that someone in the group had spiked the samples with tritium. Although unfounded and eventually proved untrue, the allegation effectively dampened Bacchus's remarkable claims. But I think the main part was that I had done work which was against the paradigm, and that was what they were really upset about. The people had laughed at him and said, what the heck are you doing trying to disprove the laws of nuclear physics? And of course, that's exactly what we were doing, <laughs> and succeeding. <as> well. <laughs> the tritium work was the first indication to me that, that there was a reality. And then uh, Claytor at Los Alamos also got positive results, and so did uh, Howard Menlov. And they're people that I respect and, and could talk to personally. 
it became fairly clear that there was a, a very strange phenomena occurring here. There are also, in similar experiments sometimes, and rather dissimilar experiments sometimes, evidence of an anomalous nuclear process. However, it is conceivable that there may be a process even more powerful than nuclear reaction that physics does not yet understand. That is the mystery of cold fusion. Yet as early as 1992, cold fusion experimenters began reporting unusual appearances of trace amounts of different metals such as copper, silver, chromium, and zinc when examining their spent cells. Rechecking for possible contamination, scientists like Bakras and Miley confirmed that indeed new metals and isotopes were being formed, transmuted, during the process which produces excess heat. Kevin Wolf made many measurements of tritium. Then he got some even more astonishing results as early as 92, which were these transmutational results, the, the metal forming another metal inside the electrode, you see, which was super, super anti-paradigm. Um, you know, there's that dreadful word alchemy, which we mustn't use, but it, it was a form of that in a way, that it was creating new metals, you see. We see transmutation phenomena. We see helium-4 production. We see a range of methods of getting the excess heat. The writing is on the wall. The fossil fuel age is about to end. The sword of this panel's condemnation struck with speed and brutality, ignoring the facts in a blind rush to judgment. Hot uh, fusion physics people have uh, been very vigorous in their denunciation of this being called fusion. Right away, reports came in of excess heat much too large to be from any chemical reaction. Laboratories from Texas to India confirmed the presence of tritium, a vital determining feature of a nuclear reaction. Within two or three weeks, we got the first results, and several groups started saying, yes, we are seeing excess heat, and, uh, but the most important and unbelievable phenomenon at that time was the observation of tritium. This was a discovery perhaps as significant as the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk. There are also, in similar experiments, evidence of an anomalous nuclear process. In the free-for-all that followed the cold fusion announcement, hot fusion proponents drew the specious conclusion that cold fusion must work like hot fusion. If Pons and Fleischmann are alive, they contended, then their results must be faulty, since the neutron radiation from the fusion reaction would surely have killed them. They refused to consider that another form of the same process might be at work. In the years that have followed, the cold fusion process has repeatedly produced not only heat energy, but also nuclear byproducts such as tritium and the ash from a nuclear reaction. That all important indicator of nuclear fusion, helium. It's clearly not possible to produce helium from a chemical process. The only possibility that uh, remains is that the helium is produced by a nuclear process. If the helium is produced by a nuclear process, then necessarily there will be uh, an associated release of uh, heat. Having seen the effect with my own eyes, the claims from a few that this is impossible, um, inconsistent with all known laws of uh, nuclear physics, uh, these, these uh, suggestions are, in fact, irrelevant. <laughs> I have that well said. But notice how important the tritium was in this. And they thought it was a fraud because they didn't find the other things that usually go with fusion, with hot fusion. There wasn't the ionizing radiation. But there was transmutation, too. Now let's look at some of the samples that were collected from the WTC. You have a variety of all sorts of strange things in the air. And if you look at the melting or the boiling temperatures of these things, there's no rhyme nor reason to the amount of the quantity. It isn't that the things that boil at a lower temperature are more prevalent. What is even more bizarre is that organic material was also found with this, which shows it was not from a high temperature process. Now we get to the most exciting slide. <clears throat> this is from leaky nuke plants, what they pollute into the waterways. 
the amount of tritium, this is exponential, logarithmic actually, and it's a very high number. This is what is produced in the cell with cold fusion. This is what was found in the basement of WTC6, you know, the one with all the cylindrical cutouts in it. And this is normal background. What I use the Great Lakes for normal background. And this is from atmospheric nuclear bomb testing. You can see over time it's decreased. So it's, it's gotten down there pretty far, but this is definitely above normal. Now, a lot of folks say well, a nuke was used in 9-11. Well, do you think they could have kept Chernobyl a secret? People all the way around the world measured the fallout from that. If there was some kind of a regular nuke used in Manhattan on 9-11, do you think they could have kept that a secret? People all around the world would have measured it. There was no like Geiger counter measurable radiation that came from there. Here are some relative numbers. If compared to what was measured at the World Trade Center in terms of tritium, the background levels are one fiftieth. What was measured with cold fusion is fifty times that, but that was in a cell. Keep in mind the World Trade Center had fire hoses on it. You know, the hurricane rained on it. It was diluted down somewhat. Leaky nuclear plants have 18,000 times that. What was measured at the World Trade Center was definitely above background levels, 50 times background levels. There was tritium there. Now, why? seems to have a lot in common with cold fusion. Some other categories we didn't look at, the so-called jumpers. Uh-oh, there it goes. We refer to them as jumpers, but did they really jump? They left the building, but we don't know why. Uh, here's the airplane-shaped hole. This wingtip always gets to me how thin it is. And we have some interesting people up here hanging out of the 105th floor. Closer look, looks like this guy's taking his pants off. This guy has his shirt off. You know, if there's a fire in there, your clothes protect you from fire. We don't see smoke coming out these windows. What's going on here? Why on earth would someone want to take their clothes off outside the building? They want to live. They're hanging on to the building. This guy's hanging from a hand, uh, one hand and one foot, taking his pants off. Let's say he has some weird fetish that he just needs to take his pants off. <laughs> well, if it's smoke inside, you take it a big deep breath, step in, get the pants off, step back out. Why hang from the outside of the building? Well, if I were there and if I was told the building's on fire, I'm going to head to the bathroom right away before we lose water pressure wet down whatever extra clothing I have around, wrap it around my head and head for the stairs. I'd be wet. If the fire sprinklers came on, I'd be wet. If they didn't come on, it was hot, I'd be wet, sweating. Good chance that their clothing was wet. Now, why would they want to take off wet clothing? You've heard of active denial system? I'm not saying that's what this is, but just as a parallel. It's a microwave, they put it for crowd control. And it makes you think that you're burning up, so you just have to get out of there. You, you just leave, no matter what. You don't think about it. So maybe some people were jumping from that. Uh, would be a good reason why you'd want to take your wet clothes off. Microwave is many times worse for wet clothing. I don't know if that's what it was, but it's consistent with something like that going on inside the building, but not outside the building. And we do know the building was turning to dust inside for the hour before its demise. There's people who say it was thermite. Okay. What? Uh, reports of it as well as, you know, 
evidence of it in other ways. But there's, uh, there's, there's a cute story about uh, a new probationary officer, first day out of, out of school for being a firefighter, and he's supposed to stick with his boss. And they get up to some place, and the boss says, all right, everybody, you know, drop everything and, you know, go down a few stairs. And they get down there, and then they eventually start going back up again, and the boss says, well, where's your mask? Well, you said to drop everything. <laughs> so, but, you know, the four, the four guys. So the boss said, you get out of here. So here's this firefighter making his way down the stairs. He gets down to the third floor, and 100% of the light is blocked out because the, he described it as having been turned to dust. He knew it wasn't smoke because he could breathe. But it, the, the floor had turned to dust. It was completely filling the, the air. There's a lot of stories similar to that. Now, there were folks who, who somehow believed that thermite had something to do with it. Well, let's see if we can make some. You have a steel structure, the towers, with aluminum cladding. Let's see if you grind them up. And you end up with rust and aluminum powder. You know what that is? Thermite. Those are the ingredients of thermite. So those ingredients are going to be there anyway. But what does thermite do? Well, here's a test of thermite here. Welding a railroad car. Blinded by the light. There was something missing in Manhattan that day. People weren't blinded by the light. You know, if, if there was nukes that went off, people would be blinded by the light. That's how they were little effects. You know, how, how do you have, you know, you know what a sparkler is, 4th of July sparkler? That's what the towers would look like also if it was thermite, you know, doing things. It, it doesn't do it in the dark. Right. But it's not like, you know, thermite. That's another thing to, to, to talk about later. There is something, you know, I call them sparkles and sprinkles. But let's, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of different things, that uh, different areas, but that is a, a good thing to notice. Now, there's hot directed energy we weapon systems and there's cold ones. And looking at all, you know, some people need to see things in a data table. We have low heat, unburned paper, low seismic impact, minimal debris, you know, bathtub survives, material specific effects, you know, door latches, trunk lids, um, toasted cars at a distance, tritium without ionizing radiation doesn't have ionizing radiation. Dustification. There's really um, only one thing that fits the bill. I'm not going to describe exactly what gizmo it is, but we're knowing its characteristics. And its characteristics are amazing. We could use this for free energy. Directed energy weapon rather than kinetic energy. These are kinetic energy weapons, heat and motion, you know, wrecking balls, uh, bombs, missiles. This is from 1989. Science by press conference. This is, is it a shortcut to fusion energy? I don't want to disappoint anyone. I think I'll put my, read my lips answer here. And then, uh, and then I'll carry on. <laughs> I think that'll become clear why I'm saying that. Can you read my lips on that back in the back? It says, it says no. Energy is a long way off. That's why I say no. This is our result. Uh, it's just way off. It's, I mean, it's, a, I think, a door that's open to us, but really a door on, on physics more than on energy. Geophysics in particular could be an interesting uh, area. Don't go there, don't research there. But then he calls for a vote, and he holds up his hand. Let's vote to destroy the careers of Pons and Fleischmann, and vote that it's not science. 
Why I'm bringing this up is we want to be sure this doesn't happen again. Harry raises his hand. Department of Energy Funding. And we have Steve Coonan, who was just appointed by the first administration of Obama to an undersecretary of the uh, Department of Energy. And these guys are thinking about raising their hand. Oops. And peer pressure causes people to do things like this, too. If everyone else holds their hand up, you start holding your hand up. You don't want to be caught not holding your hand up. But they're determining science by vote. Opportunism, Jones insisted on going public quickly with his compare opportunism. Jones insisted on going public quickly with his compare opportunism. Jones insisted on going public quickly with his compare opportunism. Jones insisted on going public quickly with his compare. All right, well, let's check there. Now, let's look. The building turned to dust. Something did that. People say, well, you don't know of a technology that did that, so therefore you, it, it didn't, you know, happen. Wait, you start out with determining what happened first. It's very important because if you start out with what you know, you won't get there because you've never seen this before. But we know it happened. So therefore, there is a technology that exists that can do this. That technology can also be used for free energy. Now let's vote on that. The tower's gone. So this is more of determining facts. Did they mostly turn to dust? There exists a technology that instead of, of molecules being attract each other, they repel each other. What happened is not impossible, because it happened. <laughs> this is another Charlie Pound song about gatekeepers.
all the data says that some form of directed electromagnetic energy was used um, to basically break down the materials of the World Trade Center. And the connections that Jones has between um, the cold fusion experience that everybody can read about in, in Dr. Malov's book and with what's going on right now with the 9-11 situation, it's, it's just a mirror image of, of him muddling up and then, you know, trying to get public opinion against, you know, who, whoever his target is. In this case, um, it's, it's Dr. Judy Wood. In, in the previous case, it was Pons and Fleischmann. part is to realize we don't want history to repeat. People tend to mindlessly follow the herd. Remember about the, the problem with groupthink. You think that this person knows what they're, they're talking about and everybody joins in and look what it cost us. That was 1989 and it took 20 years to somewhat vindicate Fleischmann but it was too late. And we don't want that to happen again. And it's very important for each one of us to hang on to our own thoughts. Be independent. And otherwise, people get herded off to one side or the other. But what I see here is a lot of similarities with the tritium. What on earth would tritium be doing at the World Trade Center without the ionizing radiation? Yeah, it has transmutation, a lot of other things. Anyway... That's, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for caring. Yes. You haven't gone into the, about the, the, the airplanes. How do you explain that? Well, good question. As I like to say, uh, the towers turn to dust. Airplanes can't make buildings turn to dust. Real airplanes can't, and neither can fake airplanes. So they're a distraction. But... Often people are, you know, they've been taught that there's airplanes that hit. What happened to the passengers? What happened to the airplanes? I don't get into that because it's such a distraction, but it is an interesting question. What happened to the airplanes? Joey Moore, that flight attendant who flew out of Boston that morning, he saw the flight attendants for Flight 175. That was the last time he saw them. The flight attendants that were on 175, he saw them that morning in Boston, the ones that supposedly ended up in the South Tower. You know, that plane, Flight 175. They didn't really go in the plane. Yes, but he doesn't know where they went after that. We don't, we don't know. I think that's a different topic. I think that's a different topic. What I'm talking about here today, I'm presenting evidence of what happened. Not theories, not ideas, but evidence. And that evidence, the silver lining in that, in that horrible cloud, is that it is a demonstration of free energy technology. And that is what I am talking about here today. I'm not talking about uh, people's opinions and... I, I wanted to uh, make a point that uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Jones, he lives in a neighboring town of mine in Spring City, I'm from Utah. He's a friend of mine and of my parents. They're actually in an intentional community together. So I've got a very tight connection with him. And what I've learned today and yesterday about Stephen Jones is very troubling to me and uh, basically plays the role of a decoy of don't look here type of thing. And the reason that that's supported is because he has this evidence and he has not gone with it. It's to me blatantly obvious. So I commit to you that I will sit down with my good friend Stephen E. Jones who he knows me inside and out, and I know it's not inside and out, but we know each other really well. Um, and I'm going to be sitting down with him in person, with this book in hand, and I will say, Stephen, why don't you go with this story? Because this is very, very, very obvious. Yeah. And I will then report on my conversation, and I will either explain what, where the mental disconnect is on his part, that he didn't see this, now he does, or that he is indeed the decoy, and he's trying to divert attention as a government plant to get us to look the other way and not see something that we should be seeing that she's pointed out.
Thank you. Yes. Yeah, in addition to that, yeah, I mean, your story is so crystal clear, actually, that uh, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, um, I can see that you don't get stage on mainstream television. Oh. See, but the, in, the interesting, uh, interesting thing is uh, uh, to see where you get stage in the alternative media. Oh, because don't, you, usually, usually I don't get much of a stage there either. Um, but that's changing. And thank you to Jerome for inviting me here to this conference. And that is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. If you want to read my blog, that will give you a catalogue of how Judy has been excluded from the alternative media with the evidence showing exactly who is responsible for that. He's documented it since 2006. You can download my blog with a Kindle, an iPad, uh, and actually also a free audio book from my website. I'll mention this tomorrow, but anybody who wants to download that tonight, they can even get a free audio version because some kind lady in New York decided to do an audio book of my whole book, 370 pages, and took it upon herself to do it. So it's now in a completely accessible format for anybody that wants to read it free. That's good. Let's see some um, other questions. Can I just ask, I mean, I, I, yes. I've obviously seen was some about it. John Hutchinson on the, on the web. And I, you know, I know a little bit about it. Have you much experience with John Hutchison and the I've been there and witnessed witnessed the effects of, of his because his mother. He can get it to repeat but not all the time. Oh he can get to repeat whenever he wants to. If if you want a demonstration he can get within twenty minutes, he has the thing warmed up and going. And for people who say that you know there's this rumor that it's not repeatable, there's a picture of John sitting amongst about fifty samples. Shows it's repeatable. <laughs> Um, uh, Judy. Yes. Uh, over here. Hi. Oh, here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, great talk. I really, I really enjoyed it. It was a very good presentation. I didn't seem to be sceptical earlier. I didn't really mean to put that over. Um, but moving on, what I'm just trying to clarify. On the one hand, you, we've got the cold fusion. On the other hand, we've got the kind of Hutchison effect. Um, how do those two gel together? I know you're just saying we're only saying what we can see. But I'm, right. I'm just but, trying to kind of put it together in my head. But looking at the similarities in the evidence, John Hutchison gets all of the same, you know, transmutation. Is his, they may is indeed what be he's the same thing. Is what he's using uh, like a, a microwave type Yes. He, well, he, what, he, what he uses is interference of two, uh, at least two, different types of energy. He creates a static field using... Um, a Van de Graaff generator, he used to use Tesla coil, but he now uses a Van de Graaff generator, and he creates a static field, and within the static field interferes radio frequency signals, like microwave. And within that zone, or someplace within that zone, these effects occur. And would you say that the cold fusion uh, type effects, the, the effects of tritium, was, was as a result of that uh, exotic energy it's it, not that it's not that it's like a, I mean when I think it's an electrolytic process but it a solution but know. it seems like there's an awful lot of things in common with it yeah fascinating fascinating like let's go study it <laughs> but, yes here in Holland there were uh, television uh, images sorry yeah. here in Holland there were uh, images on television uh, for weeks on to go with uh, all kind of trucks transporting rubble from ground zero to another place. It went well, on for weeks on television here. So that gives you the impression there was It actually a went on at least till 2007. I was visiting the site in 2007 and there were trucks coming and going then. They were bringing dirt, stirring it around, scooping it up, taking it out, bringing in more dirt. It looked like potting soil, really rich dirt. And a lot of it, you know, coming in, going out, coming in, going out. And if you look at what was there, I don't know if you saw my first presentation, mm -hmm. that there's a, this lack of rubble. And Peter Jennings talking it from the studio, talking to George Stephanopoulos on the scene. You know, George, uh, we've been wondering, where's all the rubble gone? Oh, talking to a volunteer, Robert Golinski, explained it all fell down into the ground, was pulverized, and evaporated. <laughs> it wasn't there. <laughs> yes. Yes. It seems to me that you're focusing a lot on the main two towers and around. 
But on the fact that Building 7 was actually demolished or whatever, uh, seven hours later, changes any logical uh, to explain what they pretend to say that happened. How, how this other building, five hours later, is going to end up coming down. And then also, you didn't mention anything about the one plane that supposedly hit the, the uh, Pentagon. I'm talking about what happened at the World Trade Center. For you, you specifically don't want to get into Well, I'm, I'm staying focused on this. There was the most amount of evidence available for this. Also, there was a report which gave me a legal avenue to go after the uh, contractors on the NIST report. What about the building seven? You didn't seem to... I, I covered it also in the earlier talk. There's a whole lot of similarities with it. It was turning to dust throughout the day internally. And you saw an enormous amount of material pouring out of the building, one face and one face only for most of the day. And when it went away, it didn't make a seismic signal that traveled through the earth. It only left a surface wave. It did not slam to the earth. And it, the, the surface wave that it left was almost a non-existent event. Right. It, all this material going out. The, yeah, the facade was about all that was left. And it was almost silent. And you can see it if you look at some of the images of it as it's coming down. A lot of people say, well, it looks like a controlled demolition. But I have photos of it like one second apart where you see it, suddenly all the floors are frothing up. You know, this. Well, why would you say they took so many, so many hours after instead of doing it at the same time than the other? You have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Judy. This is a question about John Hutchinson. Uh, you mentioned that it was electrostatic field. He built up a, a, a static large, field, a large static field, and then he had a more than one microwave. So it was some, some type or of more. interference yeah. phenomena. So here's the question: Is uh, the interference points was was it where the field was bucking and thus were kind of on an anti node? Or, there or, really isn't so much of a of a node. It's like what one energy field does to another one. Maybe a, a way of explaining it is, you know, it's a couple of ways you can get inside of a house. You, you can bulldoze down the front, uh, the front wall, or you can use a key. What it turns out, the interference of these different energy fields, if done just right, is like a magic key that opens up this door where you get this free energy. Wow. So John Hutchison brought down the World Trade Center. No, no, no. Well, I was giving a talk in, in I was giving a talk in um, in in Portland. No, no. It, it's a, it, here's here's what's wrong with it. John and I were giving a talk in in Portland, Oregon. Somebody asked that question. Well, he he sometimes can't get it right. He, he sometimes gets it here, gets there. He can't really control it well. And I said, John didn't do 9/11. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one more. Hello, Judy. I'm an engineer myself. And if you look at uh, the events of 9-11, it's, it's a perfect uh, theater. But um, looking from the, 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 the culprits, um, you would expect that they have tried it before. And if you look at the um, anomalies in the Earth magnetic field, um, are you interested or have you been looking for the period before 9-11 if there were any other anomalies in the Earth magnetic field that there you expect? There are various things, and it's a big, you know, complex event. Um, I was also looking at the correlation between uh, solar storms and hurricanes. It turns out if there's a solar storm that, that hits the Earth, about the time you have this low-pressure system out in the middle of the Atlantic, very good chance it's going to turn into a hurricane. That's an interesting, you know, correlation there. The they, they got it first, I'm right. I mean... Uh, you know, it's, it, there's other events I've not studied very carefully, but for example, uh, Oklahoma City, it looks just like the inside mm -hmm. of Building 6. The only difference is one, you know, I've got pictures side by side, the only difference is one has some wheat checks at the bottom showing that it came from the World Trade Center. There's also other events that have happened that are very questionable, but it isn't that it necessarily happened just this way for the first time. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Sure. Just one more, this young lady yes, in the front. Yes, I'd like to hear what the, the truth movement in America, how did they react when you came with this uh, finding? Oh, that was back in 2006. So um, it, it, for example, Stephen, I'll go ahead and say it. Stephen Jones uh, 
tells people that I'm talking about ray beams from outer space or space beams. He's also the person that coined the term cold fusion for ridicule. It's not really the typical fusion. It's a different kind of process. And that helped sink it. And I remember uh, an interview with um, Martin Fleischman. He was asked if he had any regrets. He said, yes, letting my competitors call this cold fusion. Yeah, I never let people call it uh, space beams, but you know, I don't get on the air and somebody else does. But there's, there's uh, most of the people in the truth movement have genuine interests. They're sincere people. But there's collection agencies, I call them. They collect people, render them useless, keep them out of trouble. And any time we get pulled into a group, or like what somebody recently told me, if you find yourself on a garden path, leave the garden. And that, that is sort of what happens with these organizations. And you go, people tend to go with the flow. They tend to go with peer pressure. Let's, let's have a vote about you know, whether or not to trash somebody's career. Instead of, look, you know, what did these guys find? Let's go, let's go look at it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Judy Wood. We appreciate her knowledge, her courage, and her willingness to share. Thank you. Thank you.